Quick content warning for today's video. This video will contain discussions of sexual assault and rape, child abuse, medical abuse, and mental illness. Last year, I covered a game called Martha is Dead in a video, but YouTube slapped me on the arse with an 18 plus age restriction as punishment for not bothering to understand how their content flagging system worked, so if you've not seen that, you can blame my burgeoning hubris and complete willful ignorance. It is entirely my bad. Now, Martha is Dead was a mess. It had a story that went every which way possible, setting up interesting plot points before abandoning them without a care in the world, shoving all the exposition into a single puppet show at the 11th hour, while demonstrating some very misguided interpretations of mental illness and, most importantly, being pure rage bait. Bewildering rage bait. Martha is Dead capitalised on every buzzword in the book. It had impromptu necro abortions performed with rusty scissors, it had corpse facial flaying, graphic miscarriage imagery, disassociative identity disorder makes you murder people plot twists, extreme animal abuse, explicit child abuse, graphic depictions of self-harm, and it even found a way to start having Nazi flags hung about, just a cherry on top in the realm of any publicity is good publicity, gutless behaviour. And despite everything I've listed above, the worst part was that it was just really obscenely boring. For a 10 hour game that touts so many taboo themes, it was as thrilled the void as it was bizarrely pitched. A game that sees you rending the flesh from your dead sister in chapter 1 gets pretty fucking dry by chapter 6, if you can believe it. The developer LKA and publisher Wired, cool Razor logo their friends, I wonder what inspired that, was warned multiple times by Sony that much of the planned content went against their terms of service, and if they really intended to make a game so debauched and attention-seeking, it wouldn't have a place in their store in its current state. Even so, LKA and Wired ignored this and pushed ahead. When Martha is Dead was announced for Xbox, PC and PlayStation, Sony were like, I mean, we told you, our terms of service are pretty clear and we can't accept this, you will need to change it before we will host it on our platform. So the folks at LKA went full baby mode. Appealing to the free speech warriors, they posted an announcement that, well, I mean, just look at it, and I'll read it out if you're just listening. Martha is Dead is a narrative adventure recommended for adult audiences only, with play consisting of potentially discomforting scenes and themes that may distress some players. Both Wired Productions and LKA have always been open and honest about Martha is Dead content, with the sensitive depictions in play consistently communicated to the media since the game was announced in 2019. This content is also flagged clearly and repeatedly within the game itself before play begins. It is with regret that we have had to modify the experience on the PS5 and PS4 versions, with some elements no longer playable. After over four years of passion and hard work, developer LKA now requires extra time to make these unplanned changes. Martha is Dead, as a result, will still launch digitally on both PS5 and PS4 on Thursday, February 24th, but the physical retail release will be delayed to a yet-to-be-disclosed date, although we anticipate this to only be a small number of weeks. It takes zero reading between the lines to understand how bitter and bitchy this sentiment is. They play the victim here massively, playing up how much of a labour of love Martha is Dead was, how their small business is going to be ruined by Sony's censorship, and how they're merely trying to share their art with a dying world. Like LKA, it doesn't matter if you're open and honest with Sony about the fact that you're going to include content that violates their terms of service, because it still violates their terms of service. In the end, their tearful appeal hit the right audience almost immediately. All the free speech people were coming out of the woodwork to talk about how Sony was destroying art, the PSNP forums were fucking rife with arguments about what constituted free speech. The arguments swiftly bubbled out of control, the word SJW was thrown left and right, you'd skip 15 pages in and just find a wall of anime profile pictures arguing about the artistic integrity of Lollicon. It was a fucking mess, and this was how I learned about Martha is dead. Back then I was a super small YouTuber, I can't remember if I'd even cracked 100 subscribers or not, and I was kind of keen on finding more current issues to discuss in the hopes that the algorithm would even slightly favour me and push my videos past 100 views, so when I came across the topic of Martha is dead I thought, yeah alright, I, I want to have a go. Is it hypocritical of me to call a game I discussed rage bait? Yes. Do I regret it? Not really. Did I play into their hands? Definitely. Again, no regrets. Sometimes rinsing poo-poo art is far more rewarding than playing it. 
I picked up Martha is Dead, playing it right the way through, wrote the trophy guide for it, drafted my scripts, before playing it again, very slowly, taking notes as I went. Turns out they actually hadn't had to censor much to keep Sony happy. The necro abortions and the flaying scenes were still featured in their entirety, just in the PlayStation version of Martha is Dead they had just been changed from quick time events to cutscenes, so you just no longer had to press the right buttons in rhythm with the on-screen massacre, like some kind of obscene Cooking Mama spin-off. There was even a line that had been removed from the ending narration about a woman in an insane asylum who had masturbated herself bloody, but overall the changes ended up being nothing more than tweaks. It's not exactly cause for huge sweeping delays, but I suppose Wired really had to twist the knife to emphasise the fascistic terror of Sony's leadership. Hilariously, as I learned, they'd even added a censored version of the game you could choose upon startup. While I played the original version on my first playthrough, I picked this censored version in my second playthrough just to see the differences. I believe that this version was supposed to auto skip the more disturbing cutscene in comparison to like the standard version of the game which allows you to skip the same way you can skip any cutscene where they play automatically and you have an option to skip them. However my censored version of the game was bugged so unlike the original version, the standard version, the cutscenes would start playing but I, I physically couldn't skip them at all, I just had to sit through them in their entirety. Anyway Martha is Dead just ended up being a bit of controversy for controversy's sake. I guess it worked. So many people would have never heard about this game if not for the controversy but it was a transparent attempt to cultivate discussion around a game which otherwise would not have been very fun to play and again it was very buggy. After covering Martha is Dead I had friends and strangers alike recommending Town of Light to me from multiple angles. Some people told me that it was far better than Martha is Dead and Martha is Dead was merely a stray idea from some loose cannon desperate for Google search impressions. Others told me that Town of Light was just as disgusting, a bitterly exploitative story which used a very specific location and time period as justification for portraying rampant amounts of sexual assault and hysterical levels of abuse against one young woman named Rene, our main character. One person even implied to me that it had a suicide ending, which I mean, it doesn't. Not really. I guess you could debate that. It's been over a year since my Martha is Dead video, and I'm older and wiser now. I've learned a lot in my time on YouTube, so I thought I would finally take a sniff at the Town of Light and decide once and for all which side of the controversial fence I sat on. We'll be approaching this video with the structure of a genuine review of the game. We're gonna look at the concept, the music, the graphics, uh, the setting, before we move into a review of the story. Then we're going to be holding this up in comparison to Martha is Dead, how much Martha built upon Town of Light's initially well-intentioned concept and played it to the point of parody. Now I'll admit yes I am biased, bias is pretty unavoidable and presumably the reason this game was recommended to me so much by so many people was because of that bias. I know there's a lot of catharsis in watching somebody shit on a game that tries to shoehorn in historical context to vile amounts of sexual assault performed on women barely scratching the age of consent even for 1940s Italy. Whether this is done to appeal to fetish or just for the prestige of being featured in a Konami article, I find it grubby practice to specifically portray these subject matters just to win a negative bit of word of mouth. Yet at the same time, I think depictions of assault can be beneficial if they are truly there to help others understand how to recognise it. How power dynamics really work in action, how vulnerable people are affected by sexual assault. So I'm not entirely against it, plus I love medical history, medical horror, historical horror, I love tragic stories, so by all accounts Time of Light should be right up my alley if it wants to be. Town of Light features one main overarching story set in the present day, against a heavily segmented branching story set in the past, and features lots of alternative endings and side stories that all wrap up roughly the same way. The past, or more specifically the 1940s, is where our unfortunate protagonist Rene is incarcerated in an insane asylum based on the real world equivalent Volterra. Volterra is, or I suppose was, an asylum in Tuscany, Italy, which saw its doors closed permanently in 1978 after exactly 90 years of miserable, cruel and brutal service. That said, Volterra wasn't some legend of gruesome Italian history, at least as far as I could tell. While it was known for an especially brutal treatment of patients, Volterra actually closed due to Law 180. Otherwise known as the Bersaglia Law, the Italian Mental Health Act of 1978 heralded a major reform of Italy's psychiatric system. All psychiatric hospitals were closed down so that they could gradually be replaced with less brutal methods for treating mental illness, namely community-based services and empathy. That 
considered, and since Volterra wasn't a standout hive of trauma, there were very few sources available that weren't in Italian or from reputable sources. For example, a lot of, like, rags commented on it, the Daily Mail has written about it, obviously, featuring some photos from an urban explorer who visited the place around 2014, but they also attribute Volterra's closing down specifically to its brutal treatment of patients. So as with my initial impressions of Town of Light, I felt that clearly the intent here is to sensationalise rather than educate. The slightly more, but barely, reputable Daily Mirror reported a similar story. I mean, I had to peer past about 55 adverts to get a good look at the three visible lines of text, but I gleaned what I could. Both articles remarked on Volterra's reputation for electroshock and ice water therapy and experimenting on patients, locals apparently referring to it as a place of no return, but I couldn't find any sources to confirm this, so they are either all in Italian or they're just hearsay. As they both reference Town of Light, I wouldn't be surprised if that was where they got their information from. They don't seem to have done any other research, but you never know. Although Town of Light takes place on Volterra grounds, there's not a ton done to capitalise on the use of this specific location. The story revolves around Rene, meaning it could take place anywhere, and the lack of specificity really dilutes the significance of the setting. Yes, we find newspaper clippings across the game, such as one attached to a fridge in the shed at the beginning of the game, which references a woman named Julia, i.e. the main character from Martha is Dead, having been murdered, but the details don't line up enough to Martha is Dead enough for it to be a legit reference, nor are ever brought up again in Town of Light, so this doesn't exactly develop the world we're in in any meaningful way, and it's not an exciting easter egg either. At the start of the game, you see signposts to Volterra, Campo Santo, Charcot, Ferry, and Maragliand, which you would be well within your right to assume were neighbouring villages, in which case you would be entirely wrong. The asylum actually comprised many complexes. Volterra was actually part of a huge socio-economic system, which is never actually demonstrated to us in-game, so its magnitude is lost on anyone who hasn't gone out of their way to research the asylum for themselves. While Volterra was recreated fairly specifically, the asylum itself just ends up a hollow shell, interchangeable with any standard ruin. Rene apparently returns in 2016 to tour the place again, which if she was 16 in the 1940s would make her around 90 years old on her return to Volterra, so I'm sceptical of the reality we're presented with, but we will discuss that later in the video. In the present, Rene wanders the halls of Volterra, recalling the day she spent in the asylum. As we walk to a new area, something will jog her memory, a note, a drawing, a personal item, etc, and at this point will often get pulled into some kind of flashback. It works structurally. She has freedom of movement in the present day, so she can just walk between rooms, giving us a whistle-stop tour of some indescribable trauma without needing to be let out by nurses, or without needing a narrative thread that would justify a full tour of the building. The story we see is naturally extremely limited to Rene's view. I know that this is Rene's story, but 6,000 patients would be staying in Volterra at any one time. That is a lot of people, yet all the documentation we find is about Rene and another woman she met during her stay, Amara. This isn't inherently a bad thing, but the downside of this is that it means every single possible type of human suffering the developers are trying to communicate to us is lumped onto Rene. Amara escapes without a scratch because she's not really a human in this story, she's more like a beacon or a lighthouse for Rene. So we don't learn anything about any real patients. I mean, I mean, like there was a 21 year old, Francesca Agostini, who was committed to Volterra at age 21 with early onset dementia. I would have liked to have learned more about the people here, which I feel was part of the intention since lead developer does state in numerous interviews that Town of Light's purpose is to educate. Particularly when male patients were just as prevalent in Volterra, but men are entirely erased from the story of Town of Light. Those feature either serve only as one of Rene's two rapists, the cold and abusive director who doesn't let her leave, or the gentle voice doctor that bemoans Rene's needless lobotomy at the end of the game. No other male patients are shown or discussed. With that in mind, I think it's best to discuss Town of Light in order of how the game is traversed, alongside each new revelation and discussion, so that we can account for branching paths or specific twists as and when they arise. Town of Light begins with the kind of content warning that has started to make me a bit jaded in the last few years, namely the classic black screen, with hordes of white text and a vague this might not be for you kind of message that I just I find it a bit wet, you know, it's a bit moist. Now, don't take what I'm about to say as criticism specific to Town of Light. This is general criticism for a lot of games, it just so happens that Town of Light is in the firing line as it occurs to me. It's definitely a good disclaimer in terms of seek mental health help if you feel you're struggling with problems of your own and don't worry, this is a fictional person 
in a dramatized version of a real place, but often these warnings fail to fulfill their actual purpose, warning you. Let's say that, for whatever reason, I wanted to avoid scenes with rape and sexual assault, but I really wanted to explore a historical mental health institution and understand the kinds of treatments a patient would undergo. I think it's perfectly acceptable to assume that this game might not contain those scenes, particularly if it's a sensitively written medical history game. It would be well within my right to not expect explicit depictions of rape and sexual assault. And let's say I'm unfamiliar with PlayStation specific TOS when it comes to sexual assault, so I'm unsure of what even can be shown and how. So let's say I check the content warning and I think, oh okay, brilliant, you know, I'll go ahead with this and spoiler alert, there's a fairly explicit rape scene within the first 30 minutes of the game and I would have been none the wiser. In an ideal world, content warnings for a game like this, which claims to shed light on issues and be educational and compassionate, would have expandable information that provided insight. One header might say, this contains images of sexual assault, and I might click it to see more, so you know it's not spoiled for the general player, and it might say, in the first 30 minutes there is a depiction of rape, pregnancy by rape, PTSD from rape, and a medical abortion inflicted on a patient without their consent. Later in the game there is an explicit allusion towards child abuse. At this point I could go, no, I think I'll play this another day, or I can go, yeah, I think I'll be able to handle this, I'll play this. Either way, the player is being communicated with. However, having a vague content warning is the when we get there answer to are we there yet. It's patronising, disrespectful and stubborn to say the least. Treating your player like a child, not considering them worthy of the information they're interested in. It's more worth your time to just open your mouth and say 35 minutes than it is to pass someone off like that. And often with these vague content warnings, I don't see the point in wasting the screen space in the first place just to to say this game may be upsetting for some viewers. I see a lot of people hoist Silent Hill up with its own vague content warning, this game may contain graphic scenes that happens at the start of every one of those games, but even as a Silent Hill fan, and a huge Silent Hill fan, I need to remind you, just because Silent Hill does it, doesn't mean it's the gold standard. It's shit in Silent Hill, and it's shit here. These games aren't infallible bastions of quality just because you watched 15 YouTube video essays on them. And yeah, they're pretty dated in terms of that kind of thing, but that doesn't mean that they are there to be the expectation. And not to be crass, but I've got a content warning they forgot to include. These fucking loading times. The loading times for Town of Light are utterly heinous. For a map this size and a story this simple, it is sitting somewhere in the range of Assassin's Creed Valhalla PS4 loading times. It's absolute minutes. And I know that's a small issue, so take it with a pinch of salt if you prefer, but oh my god. I'm just saying, Rene could walk the perimeter three times over in the time it takes to load this game once. Anyway, sorry, let's actually discuss the game now. Although we don't have control of Rene until we begin in 2016, the game does start with a snippet from 1942. Rene in her bed, or a bed, trying to wake up and look around. She can hear noises, laughing, but she can't move and she soon slips back to sleep. 2016 dawns. As the town of light opens, we see a road sprawling ahead of us with ruins to our left covered in overgrowth, foliage. The graphics are pretty spotless in town of light and the same goes for Martha is dead, only better, and probably serves as the linchpin keeping those loading times so long, but really these are fucking long loading times. There's a lot of effort made to create a map that looks as photorealistic as possible, like the developers actually began with the map itself and then decided that it was too good to waste, so they added the story in second. Trees bristle with individual leaves which cast individual shadows on the dusty ground, the inside of buildings feels cold and gloomy as you adjust to the light, and while gates and doors open silently and like mechanically a bit too smoothly to feel real, they look great when they're stationary. On the topic of doors actually, you really can see the way they created the game's visuals first and the mechanics second. The asylum is full of double doors, but each half of said double door is too thick to walk through, so you have to open both of them every single time you want to enter a room. You do this by clicking on a door and it will swing open towards you. Only if you're even slightly in the way of the door's pathing, and since they all seem to open towards you, you always will be, the door will stop on you, it will get stuck. And there's no sway on these bad boys, you can't just slip in through the gap. You click it again and it closes. So you do another big step back, click it again, and then it fully opens. And then you repeat for the other door. For basically every single door in the asylum. And for a game that 
has you constantly opening doors, it could have done a little bit more to keep the action from feeling like tripping on my face every three minutes. For a game that claims to feature no live enemies, I feel like this wooden army was overlooked in the synopsis. The inside of the asylum is silent and still, so much so that other games would certainly pepper in a few cheap jump scares, but not Town of Light. I mean, I never quite relax around any game that refers to itself as a horror game, but I eventually began to trust that Town of Light wasn't going to shag my ears with a bass-boosted belter from the corner of a dark room. Instead, you just wander. Despite the bright lights as you're exploring the asylum in the middle of the day, many rooms are extremely dark. There's an insidious creepiness to this game, a learned behaviour from similar horror titles that makes you especially wary. And if there's one thing LKA does exceptionally well, it's graphics. But the real gem of Town of Light is the illustration, done most frequently to show flashbacks. In these illustrations, while Rene is portrayed very normally for a young woman, other characters are expressed in very discomforting ways. Rene's mother and the nurses are portrayed with these haunting hollow eyes, her classmates are portrayed as animals, Rene's feelings of anxiety manifest in these trailing shadowy hands from her eyes and mouth. The music is sombre. <laughs> the music is sombre. It hits as we follow the dusty track, watching the title card flit up onto the screen. Town of Light. In a manner too specific to be coincidental, rays of sunshine filter through the leaves and land right on the text itself, illuminating it. And we wander up to Volterra, psychiatric facility with the soft keys of a piano jingling in our ears. This place has no meaning to us, but it does bear meaning for Rene. And we're not yet supposed to know that it is Rene, but beyond offering a potential few new revelations we might not originally have considered, it doesn't actually hurt our experience to know that this is Rene. As we step in, we're able to pick through some papers and explore. Rene knows Volterra well enough that she'll straight up announce the location of the power supply when we try to switch on lights, but the map is small enough that you'll probably run into it yourself with little effort. The use of a real world setting definitely has its ups and downs. 1888 buildings probably weren't designed with later video game adaptations in mind, so this building is not structured in a way that necessarily lends itself to an engaging journey through it. Especially when walking around it in the present, where not a lot happens beyond flashbacks. Often, story-based games will have areas that open up procedurally as the story expands, but in Town of Light, the building has two wings with an upstairs. So while the building does progressively open up, it just opens up extra wings randomly, which doesn't lend itself to a seamless story. There's a reason why games like What Remains of Edith Finch have such a winding tight map to explore. We're not just crafting the image of a quirky family with a thousand skeletons in its closet, but also just in terms of directing the player around, creating a feeling of intrigue and giving us things to want to look for. The developer has clearly done as much with Volterra as they can do. The game makes an effort to have you step out into the grounds, the greenhouses and beyond, to graveyards and churches and over rolling hills, but I think this game's map really does just draw subconscious attention to how game worlds very really work so well when mirroring real life. I felt like a marble pinging back and forth in a tin can. If there was more to see in each room, then yes. Absolutely, but the game is bare and the walking speed is an utter crawl. So I didn't find much pleasure in the exploration beyond initial impressions of each room, especially since the game has several branching storylines. Some chapters having four pretty different, distinct alternative versions that you are encouraged to replay and see. It ends up feeling more like a digital walking tour of a historical monument that you find in museums. You know, the ones where you can walk around in like a 3D modelled ruin and have information piped through to you as you go. While the story is very detailed, it feels oddly separate from the rooms it's taking place in. What's more is that the game is fairly unpolished beyond those initial impressions. I had a recurring bug where picking up a book or note to read would occasionally cause the game to lock me in that UI. No matter which buttons I pressed, I couldn't close the book, so I was just stuck staring at pictures of lobotomy diagrams until I gave up and restarted the game, which was unintentionally meta, I'm sure. Activating the menu with the triangle button will bring up four options. Experience, Rene's diary, memories, and medical records. There's no indication that the triangle button actually triggers a menu at all, the tutorial doesn't draw attention to it, so Experience was, I believe, added in a patch since I checked out some Let's Plays of Town of Light and it wasn't visible in the older ones. This tab gives you a line-by-line -line log of every single thing Rene thinks and says, presumably so that you can look back over it if you need any clues as to what you need to do next. Rene's diary is assembled from pages of notes you find around the asylum, detailing much of her life before being incarcerated. Memories are added as you go, as you explore and collect associated memories, and medical records is self-explanatory, again a collection of notes found across the map. Due to the realism of the map, 
there are fucking loads of doors in this building and they're all enormous piss takes to open, directions are janky, and despite having a dedicated hint button, Rene always has the clearest guidance exactly when you don't need it. Like, the second you are genuinely stuck because Rene wants to warm her doll up and you don't realise that means you need to take the doll downstairs, put her in a wheelchair in the hall, take her to the elevator and back to the top floor, and wheel her under a set of lights in one of the front rooms, Rene's hint will just be something like, I should warm up my doll, and not the satnav-esque clear direction she drops when you just need to walk into the adjacent room. Ultimately, mechanics are not the strongest point of Town of Light, which leaves us with one thing, the story. So we will separate our assessment of the aspects of this story into two main segments. The before, i.e. depictions of Renee's childhood and the manifestation of her mental illness, and the after, her time in the asylum and her treatment and abuse there. Renee's early years are documented in Town of Light through the pages of Renee's diary, which are scattered across the locale. Through Renee's diary, we can see that her home life was extremely unstable. Her dad's out of the picture for whatever reason, leaving her mum, a single mum in the 1930s, to try and raise Renee and keep the house afloat. She finds work, sure, but Renee remarks that her mother works extremely hard, especially during winter, giving the impression that the struggle is very real for the two of them, despite how much effort she puts in. With this, it's not long until Mr. Onofrio is swiftly on the scene, a man who Renee catches in the act of blowing her mum's back out in this especially haunting shot. In a later flashback, we see him pulling back Renee's duvet where she sleeps with her doll, implying that he molested her. It's unknown as to whether this was another quote unquote service he was paying for, and it's unknown how frequently and to what extent he did this, but as we all learn, Renee is deeply traumatised and for good reason. It's clear that Renee also felt alienated and alone at school. Once she began seeing the light, she began to see the people around her with uncanny twisted faces, or with the faces of animals, giving us not only the explicit symptoms of a chronic mental illness, but also kind of telling us that Renee feels like a different species from them altogether. Upon entering her school in a later chapter of the game, Renee watches the doors of her classrooms turn to the doors of prison cells, with tiny clawing hands reaching out and grasping as she walks past them. The game introduces us to a doll called Charlotte, who makes frequent appearances across the story. As she's introduced to us through Renee, and we initially have the impression of a being of sentience, in, in a way, she is. It becomes evident early on that Charlotte represents something deeper within Renee's story. On one hand, she is Renee's inner child. Renee laments that she didn't deserve to be loved, didn't deserve to live, and that she was worried that her mum would abandon Charlotte because of that, i.e. Renee. Despite her mother caring for Charlotte very much, Renee commented that she couldn't shake the feeling of dread, as though something would happen to the doll, and that the doll wanted to hurt her. I think Charlotte clearly represents a part of Renee that Renee Renee doesn't want to acknowledge. Whether it's an aspect of her own vulnerability that is too raw and vulnerable to be looked at too closely, Charlotte is as much a part of Renee as Renee is. There's some suggestion of disassociative identity disorder here. I don't know if it's strictly accurate to the way that disassociative identity disorder actually works, um, but voices in Renee's head frequently speak to each other, as in one-on-one -on -one conversations, arguments, two people speaking back and forth with different perspectives and intonations and Charlotte sometimes pipes up to speak to Renee in that way. When debating reading her medical report, the seemingly only one in the building and the one that has been lying here abandoned for half a century, the two versions of Renee argue about the benefit of seeing this information, whether it's worth learning about who she is in the face of potential punishment. Yet, towards the end of the game, late into chapter 12, Charlotte also speaks to Renee and seems to be a mouthpiece for a braver part of her. Even Renee's mother, Ada, comments that Renee can't communicate when she's distressed. The doll becomes her voice, eyes and ears. As we follow Renee's journey of self-discovery across the story of Town of Light, she becomes more and more resentful of her own identity. She vocalises to Charlotte that she wants to lose her voice, eyes, hearing, lose herself forever, before stabbing herself in the stomach with a pair of scissors she just randomly seems to have tucked in a back pocket or some kind of fanny pack. Well, depending on which branch you're on. I saw the scissors suicide happen twice, and I did all of the branches, all of the endings. Once inside the hospital and once out in the park, but my friend who played through actually never saw this scene. Despite this being some kind of definitive act, the game has another a few chapters in it yet. And I don't believe that this is a suicide of sorts. I'm firmly in the camp that Rene has been dead the whole time, and as a ghost wanders the ruins of Volterra, trying to make sense of the life she lost back in the 40s. Why she has scissors? I don't know. Maybe there's an early learning centre on site somewhere. Even so, it's an unusual twist and not one that I found especially profound. It just feels like a way to facilitate the start of a new chapter from a fade to black in the edgiest manner possible. Rene hears voices, sees visions, and experiences strong delusions. Doctors record that Renee rejects food and drink because
because she believes it's dirty and has been tampered with. She claims her milk is full of urine and spit and throws it at fellow inmates at full terror. This links back to the notes surrounding her admission, specifically in Rene being a hypochondriac who believes she had tuberculosis and was suffering from food deprivation. Rene claims that she hears voices that order her to do things, which may be Charlotte or it may be another voice, and hears children singing. Rene frequently cries, weeps and laughs when subjected to any stimulation, but is also introverted and seems dazed, unable to focus. Other medical records report that she is strange and impulsive, i.e. she requested two eggs to make breakfast, but when she received them she just threw them in the air. Renee takes her clothes off and excessively masturbates. She also lashes out and bites nurses that try to remove her from the shower after she's been standing under the water too long. Initially admitted to Volterra due to, quote, promiscuity, depression, and a volatile relationship with her mother, Renee's sexuality crops up frequently in her own recollections and the medical records kept about her. One doctor reported that she engaged in occasional prostitution, but didn't specify the currency of said prostitution, which was confusing. Yeah, actually, when we first entered the asylum, the first room to the left features some coins that were honestly used within Volterra as an inpatient economy. Unable to be used outside the asylum whatsoever, these were probably the things that she was bartering for, but it's unconfirmed and Renee's apparent prostitution sees no explanation or backing by her medical notes. There's a moment where Renee is reading her own medical file when she cuts away to comment, a lunatic that lives in sin. Could anyone ever believe that she was the victim of sexual violence? Certainly not. It's unknown as to whether another personality is commenting cruelly about her, or whether Renee is sarcastically commenting about her own treatment and the lack of empathy displayed about her sexual assault when she also engaged consensually with people on her own terms. The biggest example we see of this is Renee's apparent obsession with a fellow inmate named Amara. To Renee, Amara was the only thing that got her through her time in Volterra. Amara sat by her bed when she was tied down, they stole food from the kitchen together and ate it on the bench in the garden, Amara and Renee became physically intimate and would have relationships of sorts in the showers together and while sat on the bench. Renee claimed that the blinding light behind her eyes would slip away when she was with Amara. Returning to the asylum in 2016, Renee just kind of assumes that Amara will be there and goes to the kitchen looking for her 90 years later. She walks around the kitchen opening big pots as though Amara is just going to jump out and say hi. When she's not there, Renee is just like, oh silly me, she'll obviously be in the shower, an indication that she's not quite all there. However, as we read the reports about Renee scattered across the hospital, we learn that she spends time in the garden alone, in the shower alone, and pleasures herself excessively. When we find correspondence from Amara, Amara discussing Rene, we learn that Amara knew her a little bit, but more so in passing than intimately, and was released from the hospital during Rene's stay. I imagine Rene probably spent a lot of time daydreaming about the one person she was attracted to and felt comfortable with, and ended up confusing that with real life. She even commented, that woman and her smile kept me alive, which pretty explicitly links Amara to Rene's will to live. When visiting the greenhouse, we see a flashback to Amara having intercourse with a male employee or inmate. Was that Amara and did Renee genuinely see this, or was it Renee clouding her memories through Amara? However, the Volterra staff straight up claim in their own reports that they can't confirm Amara's existence, yet we see a photo of Amara and correspondence in her own words in Volterra, so we know that she existed and it was weird and perhaps even intentionally spiteful for the Volterra staff to cast doubt on her existence. Renee's always been an anxious person, as evidenced by her quote, I was always afraid, a fear that wore me down. I was terrified of everything, even and thinking. And this anxiety serves as a backdrop to a lot of her struggles, both as an individual and when she was caged in Volterra. Renee has some severe PTSD, which is triggered by some pretty obvious things. One nurse comments that upon receiving a letter from her mother, Renee grew anxious, threw soup over a fellow inmate, and attacked doctors. Not wanting to agitate her further, the Volterra administration blocked any further letters from reaching Renee. Renee experienced another flare-up of PTSD when visited by Mr. Onofrio, who she sees standing at the foot of the bed in the blinding white light while sedated, meaning she looks up from a daze into the eyes of a man who raped her as a child, whilst not fully in control of herself, restrained to a bed and unaware of what exactly was happening, which as you can imagine is very traumatic. As if to detach herself from the mental duress caused by Mr. Onofrio's visit, Renee refers to him as a doll. She wasn't Charlotte, Renee says reproachfully, highlighting how narrow her view of the world becomes when she is experiencing the truest form of her PTSD. Seeing her classmates as animals comes full circle again with Renee 
day. Whilst visiting a kind nurse who Amara asked to keep an eye on her, Renee encounters a group of terminally ill children who lived in a pavilion just off the asylum grounds. Despite these children being fairly harmless, she remembers them viscerally, coughing up blood, reaching for her, chasing her like ghosts. Renee also sees, as I mentioned before, blinding white light even when her eyes are closed. She comments that once she turned off the light, it didn't go dark. It was a limitless immensity, blinding white light. The light is so prevalent in Renee's world that when it finally dims, her only assumption as to the cause is that she has died. That is the only time she can imagine reprieve. They scarcely knew me, but still felt like they could decide on my life. Renee's statement comes towards the end of the game, shortly before she submitted for the transorbital lobotomy that bookends Town of Light, and that is true. Throughout the game, we are granted insight into Renee's treatment of Volterra, from arrival through to the event that effectively kills her, at least the Renee as we know her. Renee is to humanise the moment she arrives on scene. When you went to an asylum, you lost the right to own anything. Everything you arrived with was packed up and stored. I stopped living there. They dragged me away, stripped me of my clothes, I tried to explain what was going on in my head and they tied me down for days. I was alone with my nightmares. It wasn't fear anymore, it was madness. One of the first major events of Renee's story we're presented with is her rape. Lured away from the dining room by an attendant who has snatched Charlotte, Renee follows this man into the bathrooms and he rapes her in the bath. She later refers to him as the master in the realm of light, the crucible of her madness incarnate. The scene is very simply drawn and although Rene is portrayed nude, there's no visible penetration, but it's still a difficult scene even without that. To add insult to injury, Rene becomes pregnant off the back of this assault. With the choice to abort taken from her, she is forcibly medically aborted. I mean, Rene rejected the child on every fundamental anyway. She referred to the pregnancy as an illness growing inside her, an evil she had committed, and says that she can feel hell growing closer to her through this, but if someone takes your choice to abort, even if that would have probably been the decision you'd have come to, it's still a choice removed from you, which is probably a difficult thing for Renee to deal with as well. And while we do see evidence that another member of staff tried to report the rapist, the issue was ultimately tucked under the rug and hidden away, blamed on a stranger that snuck onto asylum grounds. One note from a nurse to a person referred to only as A refers to the pregnancy as Renee's fault, a result of her getting in trouble, running amok on asylum grounds. Volterra is a prison, with doors that are only locked and unlocked from the outside, penning tens of people into small rooms at the same time. By the same merit, other patients in Town of Light are never depicted like they are supposed to be something to be feared or mocked. I really enjoy Outlast, for example, and I've always assumed that the inmates in Outlast were especially freaky because they were being experimented on, so I gave that game the benefit of the doubt, but patients in that game are unfortunately a spectacle to be stared at. They have sex with weird things, they write in blood and shit on the walls, they sit in the corner muttering uncomfortable things, just loud enough for you to hear. The patients are there to be an uncomfortable bit of trim on the wider tapestry of horror, something inhuman to be stared at, something for a twitch clip or a montage. In Town of Light's case, patients all sit together, and while they do have odd mannerisms and their own mutterings, they are in enough of a crowd that they're not drawn attention to individually in a manner intended to be funny or gross. They're not the origin of jump scares, they are depicted humbly, you feel pity for them. They encourage a kind of aching frustration, like you want to help them. It was a sensitive way to depict people in need of psychiatric help. Beyond this virtue, the rest of the patients still saw fairly limited development. I suppose limited is better than bad, but through research I learned that the patients of Volterra took part in a wide variety of activities and underwent a huge variation in treatment. There's a lot to look at here that Town of Light kind of forgoes altogether. Patients grew their own crops, they raised livestock, there were barns, fields, storehouses, an abattoir, they made clothes, learned carpentry, did repairs, and while this was probably a method of keeping them busy, this could also have been an opportunity to raise some interesting connections to current prison systems, where prisoners are exploited for cheap and free labour. However, this detail was entirely expunged, probably so that they could make room for another comment about how much she masturbates in the shower. Renee's aforementioned shower masturbation sessions earn her a stay in the slightly agitated ward, which has the same naming convention energy of Weenie Hut Jr., but despite the modest naming, is apparently something to be truly feared. It's at this point in the story where Rene begins to undergo more extreme treatments, being tied down for long periods of time with all doors and windows closed, but the light behind her eyes still blinds her, sheets are pulled tight over her head and she is waterboarded, forced into ice water treatment, injected with multiple sedatives, including by her still employed rapist, which cannot be nice, and electroconvulsive therapy. The woman in the bed next to her chokes on her own vomit, having been tied down for excessive masturbation, surprise surprise, but Volterra was so full of so much screaming that no one came when Rene called. Mr. Onofrio visits her in this state, staring down at her from the end of the bed. All correspondence to and from Ada, Renee's mother,
father is blocked, and despite Ada petitioning the director directly for René's release, she is ignored and René's incarceration continues. The notes you begin to find at this stage of the story state that René was extremely aggressive and volatile, and quite honestly I can't blame her. Right towards the conclusion of the game we learn that René's condition actually begins to improve, whether through their treatment or simply because René found the will to begin playing their game. By May the 5th, 1943, doctor's notes record that René was doing well. Her spatial and temporal orientation was good, she was eating and washing, speaking to others, and her therapy was suspended. Later in December, René calmly asked to leave, at which point the decision was made to monitor her for six months. Only a spanner in the works. Her mother had killed herself two years prior out of the guilt she felt for sending René away, and the lingering effects of her own mental health problems, and René hadn't been told about this. So when René's observation period ends and the psychiatric opinion was unfavourable, René's discharge was denied because she had no home to return to, and this is how she found out that her mum had died, and obviously she went absolutely ballistic. She attempted suicide twice, once by suffocation and once by hanging, but was stopped both times. In response to these suicidal tendencies, the administration made the choice to lobotomise her. The lead up to this scene is probably the most educational this game actually practically becomes. We see on-screen diagrams of the process of a transorbital lobotomy. We learn that it was pioneered by a doctor named A. E. Morris, improved upon by an A. Flamberti, and further built upon by W. J. Freeman. We learn that the operation involves gaining access to the frontal lobes of the brain by soaring through the bones of the orbit above the eyelids, and performed by damaging the lobes through the injection of blood or formaldehyde, or just scrambling up with a special instrument. We learn that while many patients received invalidating damage that rendered them severely disabled, some patients saw an honest improvement in symptoms and went on to live normal lives. And so this was the norm until the discovery of chlorpromazine in 1951, an antipsychotic medication that is used to treat anxiety, mania, psychosis and schizophrenia. As the game reaches a crescendo, we see this performed on René in a brutal display, with no option to skip, instead you're forced to watch this horrifying ordeal, and unfortunately she is not a patient that goes on to lead a normal life after the lobotomy. The final narration of the game is a male voice, her doctor, who reports that by 23 years old, René was lacking all vitality, she couldn't read or write, she could barely speak, and she couldn't dress herself or wash. She also continued to talk about Charlotte and Amara, indicating that her psychosis hadn't even been resolved, she'd merely just been trapped with it. The final line of this game is, her life had been thrown away, and no one did anything to avoid this. While this game is labelled as horror, I believe it's not so much mislabeled as just a lot of these online storefronts lack the available tag language to properly describe the horror of Town of Light. When glancing over other reviews for Town of Light, I noticed a lot of negative reviews bitterly remarking on the game's lack of scares, despite being sold as a horror. And I certainly can't blame anybody for being disappointed by a game like this. Asylums are synonymous with tense horror, the name and banner image for Town of Light is fairly nondescript, and while the description of the game is honest enough to be an apt summary of the game, it fails to write off a possibility that this will be a scary game, and by the same merit I don't think any marketing agency would be delusional enough to be like, this isn't really scary, when they're advertising a horror game. I think it's just a difficult overlap of genres and expectations, and I don't blame anybody for being disappointed by this game, nor do I blame the way that it was advertised, I think it's a catch-22 kind of situation. Because this game isn't especially scary. Sure, the dark rooms will have you a bit hesitant at first, accustomed to other games that will exhibit jump scares ranging from the cheap to the fun, but the music is very everybody's gone to the rapture, and the voice acting is very what remains of Edith Finch, creating an atmosphere of inquisitive trust. I think the horror of Town of Light lies more in the implications behind each depiction, the horror of what humans are able to inflict upon one another very easily. With the rapist having his way with any female inmate of his choosing, and remaining employed to haunt them and wield power over them, speaks to anybody who's been harassed harassed by a boss or person in power, who then goes on to remain in said power, haunting you like a ghost, making you sick to your stomach at the possibility of running into them every day. I think the horror of knowing that René was incarcerated for promiscuity and having a difficult relationship with her mother was horror. Knowing that serving cunt a hundred years ago could have culminated in lifelong incarceration in an asylum full of abuse and medical neglect and electroshock treatments and transorbital lobotomies is pretty horrifying. Putting yourself a hundred years ago, considering how vague a label promiscuous is, and knowing it's essentially in the eye of the beholder whether or not your life is ruined is very scary. But what stuck with me personally with Town of Light was the implication. Renee was incarcerated at 16 in roughly 1940. She returned in 2016, which would make her about 90 years old, but she has a young voice and young hands, and seems to have made no emotional progress whatsoever in the time since. You could assume that she's hallucinating, maybe a 90 year old on her deathbed reliving her life, or 
thought maybe a 16 year old in the ward, but I don't subscribe to this theory. My personal interpretation of Town of Light is that Renee is dead. I think she's a ghost, and I think she's been wandering the halls of Volterra for a long time. I think she technically died during the lobotomy, and regardless of what happened to her body, which may or may not be buried in one of the unmarked graves in the graveyard down the road from Volterra, she returns to Volterra in the same developmental state that she was lobotomized in. I believe that Renee haunts the place trying to piece together what happened to her, hence the potential story branches and the way the game encourages multiple replays. She arrives at the gates, enters the asylum, moves the furniture, opens the doors, sifts through the evidence, and relives the horror of her stay at Volterra, comes to different conclusions, walks down different paths, and in chapter 12 she has a breakdown. She can't handle what she's learning, she takes a pair of scissors to her abdomen, and I believe that the loop starts again here. And I think she's been doing this every single day for years, because she never quite finds the answers that will put her to rest. And it fills me with dread and existentialism to watch somebody trapped in a loop of their own traumatic memories, a personal hell that they can't ever escape, nor ever had a say in, in the first place. Overall, the Town of Light is an interesting concept, but one of the main questions that kept plaguing me about this game was just why? Why, of all the stories you could have told, of all the games you could have ever made, why did you make a game featuring the indulgent abuse of a 16 year old girl in a mental asylum? Why was she characterised so heavily through sex and her sexual assaults? Why was this needed in any capacity? Volterra closed its doors in 1978, alongside every similar asylum in Italy. I wondered why one might feel the need to share the story of a fictional inmate from this place. I mean, you can hardly say you're raising awareness of asylum treatment, when awareness of asylum treatment was raised sufficiently enough to have them all shut down 50 years ago. To draw attention to society in general, demonising and neglecting the mentally ill? Yeah, I can definitely believe that one, and that's what I assumed the intention was at least. The director of Town of Light even commented that the studio's goal was to face and tackle controversial topics like like mental illness with deserved sensitivity. And I suppose they do? I can't really fault them on their depiction of mental illness. Seeing the argument raised that the struggle of every woman in this game is directly defined by her sexuality, Renee's story, her mother's prostitution, Amara's promiscuity, but we also only see the lives of three women, the writer could have made more of an effort to be sure. The decision to use three women as our main characters boils down clearly to their perceived sexual vulnerability, which is demeaning and limits the view of how women really could be affected by mental health issues of all kinds, plus the abundance of political reasons why somebody might have been incarcerated in Volterra. Moreover, is it respectful? to plug an educational story based on real world events with trophies? Maybe not. Town of Light made me challenge my preconceptions about games like this. I often go into games about mental illness, especially insensitive ones, asking does this need to exist? And that approach has served me pretty well up to this point, being that I've never actually played a, a really good one, an accurate one, a well intentioned one. You can just kind of say not really, and in some circumstances you can even say not really, and it has been actively harmful by existing. So super not really, which sorts it pretty easily. But now that I've actually been faced with a depiction I would consider to be well-intentioned and kind of respectful, this is now a question I actually have to answer, and I've never had to before, and I think the vulnerabilities in my simple question have been highlighted because it's definitely a discussion that needs a little bit more nuance. Does this game need to exist? Not really. Can it exist? Yeah, sure. Does it harm anybody by existing? I don't think so. I went into Town of Light so sure that I would hate it that I skimmed a playthrough with the volume off, I just made notes and listened to music. It was only when I went back to clean up, properly review my notes, and went back a third time to watch a playthrough that I gave it my full attention. And I didn't like it, per se, it's not a fun game, I'm not even sure if it's a game I could ever recommend to anybody. I also don't know which lessons we'd learn beyond treat the mentally ill like human beings, which is quite fundamental. I didn't learn anything useful about Volterra or its inmates until I began researching the background of this game, which seems counterintuitive to Town of Light's intention. Developer LKA pitched an Indiegogo campaign requesting 30,000 euros to create the title, and by the deadline they had only raised 2,500, coming in at under 10% of the goal by a pretty significant margin, so this isn't a game with a wide appeal. Not many people want to see things like this, and yet I think it's worthwhile that they made it. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it, and while you could argue that there's no point dredging up the past, I'd argue that there probably is, especially when it can serve as a reminder of what we are capable of. But having played Martha is Dead 
first, seeing the eight-hour onslaught of horrendous abuse directed at a 16-year-old girl throughout that game, something about Town of Light never quite sat right with me. It felt like the developer got dumped by a medium-length brown-haired girl back when he was a teenager and carried a grudge or something. I don't know. If you've played Martha is Dead first, you probably understand why I approached Town of Light with so much hostility. That game is real crap. Although the deluxe edition was released with a gorgeous set of tarot cards that I do kind of wish I'd snagged. Two games featuring two female leads who suffer horribly and gratuitously, the first a little bit more muted and the second just a complete circus of disrespect. Rene walks a close line of being a fetishized, battered young woman, but I think just about avoids real scrutiny. She's based on the diary of a schizophrenic girl who remembered in an altered state that she saw brilliant bright light that filled her mind, but clearly since the developers wanted to give us a real flavour, of a variety of inmates, she ends up with all sorts of mental bells and whistles attached. Rene is what's known as a composite character, that is to say she is assembled from little bits and pieces of tons of different people, as researched by LKA. The risk with composite characters is pretty evident. If you have five people who each undergo one trauma apiece, and you condense them into one person who suffers five traumas, you push the boundary of fetishization, especially when those traumas are sexual. If you've ever heard of Vomit Gore Dolls, a trilogy featuring a woman who's destiny it is to just suffer infinitely and be sick constantly, the tragic story tends to serve more as a way to justify the on-screen fetish and contrive reasons for the characters to be in that situation, more so than to tell a tragic story that you feel empathetic to. Town of Light felt earnest, if not reliant on sexual assault tropes. It felt like a well-intentioned way of demonstrating female suffering, written by a person who can only visualise female suffering through a lens of sexual assault. This contrived fetish was something I kept an eye out for while I was playing, mainly because it's one of those things where once you notice it, it becomes super obvious. But beyond a few scenes where Renee was drawn particularly damselly in her bed, I didn't get the impression that this was something the developer was wanking himself silly to. As I watched the scene with Amara and Renee in the shower, I noticed that this picture, the picture of Renee with her head thrown back in orgasm, is the picture used for Town of Light's banner. I felt it was kind of cheap. An interesting choice to take the story of a brutalised girl and boil the depiction down to a surprisingly voice voyeuristic snapshot of lesbian sex. But beyond that, I felt like the game held up to scrutiny. And as I'm sure you've noticed, scrutinise I did. Town of Light is no Martha is dead, it's honest and well-intentioned, despite feeling as though it accidentally relies too hard on tropes of sexuality when telling a tragic story, but it at least tells a story worth telling. I want to finish this video with a huge thank you for watching. Thank you to the people who so patiently waited for this video to come out, including uh, Brawler, who asked me about this in the comments absolutely ages ago, and I haven't seen them in a while, so if you see this mate, I hope you're doing well. Sorry it took so Long. I want to thank my patrons for being here and I want to remind you that my October patron event is happening. I will be releasing one horror movie every single day in October and they're not going to be five minute reviews, they're all going to be like proper reviews of individual movies, they're going to be like minimum ten minutes each, full length videos. Some of these will make it onto the YouTube channel during the month, some of them will trickle in later, some of them will be free for non-patrons on the patron page and some of them will be patron only. So if you want to support that just hop over to my patron. I want to specifically thank Sam Jones, Julia, HM, Fosh, Carl DeRocher, Brody Cullen, Brendan Sidereal, Bile Hamaho Futh, Brian Bullock and Alice Teeters for being my highest tier patrons. And I want to remind you all to like the video if you enjoyed it, comment your thoughts on the game and other similar titles, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and thank you again. I'll see you guys in the next video.